And then Logos and Mythos. This is a big issue now, and I'm relying quite a lot on Karen Armstrong, who has written a whole series of books about this. She was, she's a very interesting lady. She was a nun and has written a lot about religion and, and science. But I have got some uh, respectable backup. Richard Buxton, who's a friend of mine in classics, I discussed this with him. And he defines um, myths as socially powerful traditional stories. Now, Logos, of course, is the rational factual. That's what we're using to do things. It's science and maths and uh, rationality. And we tend to dismiss myths, and they're not very important to us. But myths are about things like, well, what would it be like if there was life after death? But these stories, of course, are not verifiable, but they do require faith, and of course they do lead to religious belief. And we have to face up to the fact that there are a lot of different world religions. And uh, Christianity is the strong one around us, of course, and I totally respect uh, Christian belief. I <coughs> have a love of church music from my time uh, as a choir boy. And uh, the debate between religion and science, which I think is so misleading often in popular press and media, uh, saying, well, which is right? Is it this or that? It's got to be one or the other. But in fact, they're just different aspects of, of human nature and completely compatible. Now, why do I say that? Well, because both require faith and trust. It may not seem... Um, obvious that as engineers we have to have faith but risk when you think about risk really points up the importance of faith because we have to assume there's a real world outside of our minds which is structured in an orderly and intelligible way is it with complex systems we're beginning to see maybe there is a limit to that this rational order is contingent, cannot be deduced by logical reason, has to be discovered and is accessible to us. And we are adequate to the task. How important is experience? Well, it helps you to recognise your mistakes. But this gap between what we know, what we do, why, this is where systems thinking comes in. So how do I define system? Well, in, if you want a three-word definition, joined up thinking. Uh, Tony Blair um, started the joined up movement, didn't he, when New Labour first got in and completely failed. And so joined up government disappeared off the agenda because it was too hard to do. But it was, it was a, a quite a noble um, uh, aim. Get, I define it as getting the right information to the right people at the right time for the right purpose in the right form and in the right way. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But it's almost impossible to achieve. But th that's the goal. Who, what, why, how, where and when. A really old-fashioned idea, but important. I've been going for 45 minutes and I've only just started. But a lack of joining up is where any message doesn't get sent or received or is poor, poorly formulated, incomplete or misleading. Now, we don't think about joining up in physical hard systems, do we? Because we've got Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff's laws tell us that the flow in the system has got to balance across a cut and that the voltage, the um, potential around um, a circuit has got to balance. So that makes sure <coughs> that everything works well. Systems tells you that potential and flow is there in whether it's electrical, mechanical, water, put traffic in there. Uh, you could list a whole load of other things too. There is a potential that balances according to Kirchhoff's second law, and there's a flow that balances according to Kirchhoff's first law. In structures, we would call that balance equilibrium, uh, but in electrical, we call that um, balance in potential. Uh, there is an idea, uh, if, if you, you hear about holistic medicine, you have holistic this, holistic that. The idea being that you think about the whole, and that's what systems is about, but it isn't. Systems is really about doing it in layers, as I said earlier. 
thinking at different levels. So we need to think about the big picture and think about the detail. So here are six important things that we need to move from. The idea that complex problems can be solved, rather, in my view, they can be managed to some kind of success. Secondly, happenings or occurrences are events, rather they are part of a process. We need to think process. Linkages are linear, so many of us are taught to think in a linear way, rather they are networks, as I've just said, Kirchhoff's laws. We need to move from thinking the deeper we go, the form more fundamental we get. So the Guardian thinks that a book about string theory is more important than a book about bridges. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true, but a lot of people do, and I can understand why. But they're both important, uh, and dealing with string theory is very, very difficult, very important and good work. I'm not denying that, I'm not saying that, but so is dealing with bridges. So we choose an appropriate level for our purpose. If we're running a, a water company, we don't think about string theory. If I'm designing a bridge, I don't think about Newton's relativ uh, Einstein's relativity or quantum mechanics. Newton's laws are good enough for designing the Miao bridge. But here we are, rigour only comes from being pure. So many times we get accused of being approximate, of being unrigorous in the engineering field. Uh, funnily enough, doctors and nurses don't get accused of that, I'm not quite sure why. But we must recognise what is the nature of practical rigour. And then values. Values seem to be self-evident to many people. But rather, we need to be explicit about our values and work to find those that we have in common, especially when we're dealing with some of the world's most complex issues. So systems thinking isn't a subject, it's not a discipline. I'm not talking about systems engineering as defined by INCOSE, the International Convention on Systems Engineering. I'm talking about a philosophy, a way of thinking. It involves thinking in layers, it involves thinking in loops, it thinks, involves thinking about process, and it involves thinking about basics. And I'm going to have to skip on because of time. Here are layers. Computers are a magnificent example of layers, aren't they? There's a transistor, put transistors together in a system to get AND gates and OR gates. Put those together in a system, you get flip-flops. Put those together, you get uh, um, an adder. Put your microchip, motherboard the whole inside of the computer, the computer itself, and the internet, all these computers. So we, we work at this level, we work at this level, we work at this level. And you find computer people now working at this level, find difficulty talking to people at this level. And people at this level have difficulty talking to people at this level. So um, these layers actually create divisions, and we have to, this is where systems thinking comes in. A different type of um, emergence comes from, uh, in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of beauty. I've mentioned the VI, uh, the Mia Vite a few times, but here's a much earlier bridge, a much simpler, uh, simple yet sophisticated arch bridge built. One of the first examples of reinforced concrete, uh, uh, designed by Robert Meyer in Switzerland. Absolutely beautiful. So it's the harmony of beauty and function. So many building structures these days don't have harmony. They, they, you've got the structural and you've got the aesthetic architects designing for the aesthetic without understanding the structure. If you, the two come together as in a bridge like this, it's beautiful. I'm not going to show you this uh, because there isn't time. But if you go to this website and you look at Starlings, as you may have watched it, you can see how Starlings um, fly in groups and divide and so on. Um, if somebody wants to watch it in the discussion, we can have a look. Think about process. One of the few successes that I had was when a local firm said, David, is your system thinking any help? To me, I just can't get paid. Uh, I do all this work and nobody wants to pay me. So we did a, an analysis of all the processes in the company and we looked at, um, uh, you can't read all this, don't try. But this is um, 
what's this software called, John? Mind Map. Mind Map. And um, we started with getting paid, and we worked out all the processes. And what we realized was that he needed to cultivate his clients. So what he started to do was ring up the clients. Oh, how are you? you know, and uh, what, um, you know, this is the progress on your job, etc., etc. And it completely changed the company. It just started, the money started to flow. Just amazing. Simple thing, just making a few phone calls. Why do we need it? Well, we want to minimize the worst of times. We need to monitor risk and maximize the best of times. So we know David Cameron now wants to measure well-being and human flourishing, which is what Plato would have said. Happiness is an emergent property from the system. So here's the hard and the soft, physical, human, objective, subjective, deterministic and statistical, vague, imprecise. We can use traditional maths, mostly natural language, measure, little measure of data, reasonably predictable, difficult to predict. We want to unify. So often you hear people saying, people, purpose and process, let's put it together. Well, what we're talking about is change driven by purpose. So what we do, uh, we do what we do through what we understand. If you're going to do something, you do it through how you understand what you're addressing. <coughs> Understanding an action is a soft process. It's got, in the end, what we have in our brains is a set of patterns. Whether, however you describe those patterns, neurologically or electrically or chemically or whatever, uh, there are a set of patterns inside my head and there's a set of patterns inside your head. It isn't the reality, it is a model of the reality, expressed as pattern. Obviously, the, the brain itself is a physical thing and um, part of the physical world, so it's a hard system in that sense. All designed hard systems have a function or a role, but even natural systems play a role in how we understand the world. And sometimes it's very clear what that role is. For example, we have a lake and we, use, we dam it up and use it as a reservoir. So it does have a, an actual physical role as well as a natural one. And of course we're all concerned about saving the planet, uh, but that is the most misleading thing you ever can ever hear. The planet is fine, the planet will carry on. It's whether the human race will carry on as we know it. That's what matters, and what matters is how we deal with the risks <coughs> that we are facing. So, when we look back to the hard systems that I had before, electrical, mechanical, etc., we actually will got a soft system as well. And the potential in that soft system is the why question. The creative tension between now and the future, where we're we going to. And the flow is defined by who, what, where and when, because those are the things that change. And there are equivalents to, to impedance, like ambiguity, conflict, capacity to perform, capacity to adapt and innovate. This, um, this conflict one is really critical. And I just worry, you know, we're so worried about fighting each other in the world, we're not paying attention to the big picture thing, which is, of course, climate change. That really is quite concerning. 